Welcome back. I am Max Ada, your host. This is the Weightlifting.ai podcast, and I am joined, unfortunately, by Joshua Gibson, sports scientist extraordinaire, uh, and just all around pretty good guy. Not great, not bad, pretty good. I call him like a. He's an RP seven and a half. Okay. Eight. I give him an eight. Oh, okay. We'll give him an eight. Oh, we got a bass over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I grade all my friends. RP scale. Yeah, like an eight, eight, yeah. five. Definitely two, maybe. Yeah. Uh... Humans are just transactional for me. <laughs> right. a, they only have the purpose, and if they don't, then I don't talk. If to you them. don't have a PayPal, you're gone. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that uh, the link's in the bio. <laughs> Anyways, speaking of that, we right now are going to talk about a common technique error that we see. We're going to explain what it is, why it's bad, what to do about it, how we would fix it, how we would correct it, and you guys will walk away from this with more knowledge and, and enthusiasm to go ahead and take your lifting to the next level. Are you ready, Josh? I'm ready because weightlifting has ripped my enthusiasm from me. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is, staying over the bar, how to stay yeah. over the bar. What does that mean when someone says, you got to stay over the bar, or <laughs> stay over the bar, or you're yeah. not staying over the bar? Define it for me. Yeah, so staying over the bar is keeping the shoulders in the correct position throughout the pull, right? Because generally when someone is needing to stay over the bar or get more over the bar, it's in reference to the shoulders. Right, so if we look at the bar from the, the athlete and barbell from the side, mm -hmm. we're talking about shoulders being at least directly on top of the bar, generally slightly in yeah. front of the barbell, right? And this is gonna change a little bit depending on someone's anatomy, yeah. right? If someone has, uh, you know, three shoulders, they're gonna be a different position, or if they've got, I was joking there, but if they've yeah. got you know, a short torso or a long torso, the degree to which their shoulders may be uh, over the bar will change slightly, right? Yeah. Uh, not significantly, because we're not gonna get someone who's way out over the bar because they have a different type of uh, you know, body length, but then also the angle of their back will change as well. Someone with a longer torso is probably not gonna be completely horizontal versus somebody who's you know, built like Les Mavaretti's. Mm -hmm. He's gonna be bent out, you know, bent over the bar a lot. Yeah. So when we talk about being over the bar, where is it and where does it end? When do we not, when are we not supposed to be over the bar? Yeah, so if you think about the start position, you have, if you're looking directly from the side, you see the end cap of the barbell, and then you see the plates and the athlete, you're gonna see the shoulder joint, which is the- I call those end caps too. <laughs> uh, which is the glenohumeral joint. It's like the actual depression and where the, the bone fits in. Paging uh, Dr. Uh, Gibson here, wow. Soon. Medical terms. Another four years. Uh, but but it's, the, it's the shoulder joint or or the crease of the armpit. Right. So you look at those two you reference, reference points. the same point? Like, you just described two points. Would you pick one or the other, or is it kind of like, and I, this is a fair thing that coaches do, they yeah. lie, <laughs> and you might be like, yeah, keep your shoulder over the bar, and for one guy, you say over the joint, Yeah. The other, you might be like over the, the armpit. Yeah, so a lot of it depends on execution, right? So right. like, you know, for example, if there's someone with really, really short legs and a long body, that, that maybe has a slightly different reference point. If you have someone with really long legs and a short body, it maybe has a slightly different reference point. Uh, so you kind of move around based on what you need. So it's like, you know, generally in the start position, I'd also say like the hip crease is going to be in line with the top of the knee, and that might change a little bit. We might right. use different landmarks, but basically the shoulder joint or the crease of the armpit, uh, that's gonna sit on top of the barbell or slightly in front, and it's gonna be maintained as the athlete stands up, and their feet are gonna be flat the entire time, okay? And as they stand up, the knees are gonna track back, so when the barbell's right above the knee, right above the kneecap, the shoulders are gonna be as far forward as they're going to get, and the feet are gonna be flat, and then they're gonna make the transition where their feet flat, and they'll generally end up in a good spot if they can hit those landmarks. So, when we're talking about staying over the bar, which I just realized is probably the wrong terminology, what we wanna say is staying on top, on of, top the bar. of the bar. That's right. And that yeah. is a, a important distinction because when you stay on top, there's two errors that can occur yeah. if you're not on top of the bar properly. Yeah. One, the obvious one, is that your shoulders have moved backward and they are now behind the vertical projection of the barbell, Right. in which case you have executed the transition too early or maybe haven't moved the knees back enough in the yep. first pull. For whatever reason, you're now behind the vertical projection. Or the second error in that you are now further over the bar yeah. than you need to be yeah. and your legs have basically extended themselves maybe in, ex in excess, 
And generally what happens there is that you move away from the, the thigh, right? The barbell moves yeah. away from you. And as a result of the that issue, you're gonna have to move your body back towards the bar again to bring your centers of gravity close together. Uh, in the first area, if you get behind the bar, mm -hmm. what ends up happening is that you end up losing power because you've essentially started to extend your hip mm -hmm. and transition sooner and you've dissipated some of that like, potential explosive energy you could have had before the bar gets to the right position, right? Yeah, and the reason that happens is because muscles function to contract or to shorten. So if you've already shortened or, or yeah. contracted the muscle, right, that's force you lose. So you're trying to get to a point where everything is kind of stretched to this optimal position. Um, you know, there's, if you really want to deep dive, you can look into the length tension relationship. But basically you want to know here that if like most of the muscles are as stretched as they can be when the bar's at the hip, you're going to get as much force as you can possibly right. produce. Think about it like a slingshot. If you pull a slingshot all the way back, and you release it, you're gonna get the most power. If you pull a slingshot back and then you start to right. follow it this way and then release, yeah. you lose some of that potential power, right? Yeah, so that's what happens when you get behind the bar. What happens exactly. when you get too far over it? Right, too far over would be the opposite, right? You've, you've stretched it here and you're trying to release, but you're not gonna get any power, right? Right. So the, the issue here, the question you have, the, the, the question that I think our viewers want is, how do we go about correcting these issues? Right. The first one versus the second. So not being on top of the bar. We've talked about this before in other podcasts. Go ahead and check them out. <laughs> uh, is that, look, we want to coach a few different things in a few different styles. We have a list, kind of a checklist of what we do. First is conceptual, right? Yeah. Can we correct this with a cue? Is the right. person just executing something in a way that is wrong because that's what they think they're supposed to be doing? Right. So we cue and reinforce those things. Things. Well, uh, I, I think that's a that's an important point. You don't want to take that for granted by yes. immediately going to a fix, like a, an exercise yeah. or a change. I had one girl I coached for a really long time, Nicole. Uh, she would twist in the bottom when she would catch the snatch. And I think one day I was like, maybe just try not twisting. And she corrected it. Yeah. But I gave her so many overhead exercises and so many drills. Yeah, lucky so on that one. <laughs> and, it, and it was like, hey, just actually don't twist. And she's like, you yeah. got it, chief. And I was like, yeah. I feel like the biggest moron. Uh, but yeah. well, on that note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so so first thing, cueing, correction, right? Uh, second thing, we want to look for some kind of potential general fitness quality that's missing or, or lacking in a severe way. This could be like a you know a, a mobility issue. They just cannot move their limbs into the right position, right? Uh, maybe their start position. They're so inflexible and possess so little stability in certain places that they just can't get into a good start position. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things are gross major issues that just right off the bat you need to look at at correcting, right? Uh, and then finally, we talk about this idea of an exposure issue. Are they just not exposed to training that particular movement or that particular phase of the lift enough or thoroughly enough that they've developed you know, adaptations that allow them to do it properly. Uh, so first thing, cueing as far as you know, somebody's too far over the bar. What kind of cues do you throw at somebody right off the bat? Yeah, and you know, just to, to comment on the podcast we did uh, where we were talking about powering more than you full, I yeah. think with that conceptually, people, people uh, they, they are able to do it to a certain weight and then they really struggle. Right. Staying over the bar, I think it's a little different. I think people just generally get out of position yeah, from, right away. from lightweights all the way up. I would so agree with I that. I think yeah. this is all, almost nearly always technical in nature and generally just like they don't have the, the right technique to actually execute the lift efficiently. Um, so with cues, it's stay over the bar, right? It's get as far over the bar as possible, or it's- If somebody is too far over. If, okay, if someone's too far yeah, over, uh, then I would probably, you know, that's a good question because people generally don't get too far over the bar. And if they do, I guess it would be coupled with the hips coming up a little too yeah, quickly and then that's tipping like, early, yeah. right? So it's more so a pressure thing where it's like keep weight towards the front of your feet. Um, you're thinking about keeping the hips down or keeping the hips kind of in this like static position. Uh, so you're kind of referencing, you know, the opposite of right. get over yeah. the bar, 
pu push into your heels more, push your knees yeah. back longer. You're kind of yeah. cueing the, th the, the opposite, which maybe is actually get your knees under the bar sooner. Yeah, so, so I, I like to think of two things. If I see someone who falls over the bar too much, their hips rise too quickly, the bar moves away, they, the, the thigh and the barbell start to move away from each other, right? I like to try to reinforce keeping the bar close yeah. because it's gonna be very difficult for you to get the bar close to your thighs if it's you're too far bent over, right. right? And then the second thing, like you just said, is try to initiate the transition uh, with you know try to try to have a stronger initiation of the transition phase. So you know as the bar approaches your knee, try to start shifting your knee under a little bit, and then bring your chest up so you can get yeah. yourself in the right position. Those are good cues for, for that. As far as somebody who gets behind the bar mm -hmm. too early, what kind of cueing do you give? Yeah, I, I like to think about getting the knees as far back as possible. Right. And, and generally, it's gonna be something where it's like, push your knees back, delay the transition, uh, push into your heels. The only consideration here is sometimes people can do that effectively, but you'll see them rock off yeah. of their toes, which is kind of a no-no. So if you do that, stop it. Uh, so you'll push back into your heels, keeping your feet flat, and then transition. So you just try and delay and get yeah. that, that, that concept of pushing longer. Yeah. So then I would say we, we look at, let's discuss a little bit the general fitness qualities and, and include general strength exercises. And general, I mean like, you know, we're, things like pulls and squats and, yeah. and strength movements. Um, the perspective I come from when I look at somebody not being on top of the barbell properly, who's someone who uh, perhaps gets over the barbell too far, is gonna be a matter of their legs are probably generally weaker than their back. So it's a deviation to whatever is gonna be the strongest feeling position for them. And that's gonna be them over the bar where they're loading their back a little bit more. So I would say those kinds of people would benefit themselves by doing more accessory movements like belt squats and you know quad heavy squatting movements uh, to try and develop some strength there. Right. As, you know, we all know obviously building your squat and front squat and whatnot. But then the, the specific pulling movements I would give would include extra exercises that basically are done with a tempo that can control that position. Yeah. So you pull the bar up to the knee and then the transition above that. Uh, or even doing you know pulls where you emphasize the transition being exaggerated. So you pull the bar to your knee or above your knee and then push your knees under more deliberately as a way to sort of reinforce that. But then additionally, you know, any kind of exercises that's gonna, or pulling exercise that's gonna emphasize heavily the feeling of using your legs, initiating yeah. the pull, and especially above the knee, yeah. right? So you actually don't stop your pulls right before the problem happens, you know, pull to mid thigh, or pull to the transition, or yeah. pull past the transition to the power position, right? As a way to sort of emphasize that. From the perspective of, somebody who gets behind the bar early, what kind of exercises would you give? Yeah, and a basic kind of progression I would use is something like an RDL or stiff leg deadlift into uh, a pull with a slow eccentric. So kind of for that same reason, right, you want them to get over the bar uh, on the way up and you want them to kind of feel what it's like to get over the bar on the way down and also to build a lot of comfort and strength right. in that same yeah. position. Same kind of issue as somebody who, the opposite, right? Somebody who's right. getting behind the bar is generally gonna be somebody who's got much stronger legs than right. back, right? Yeah. It just does not feel good to be bent over the bar in that position and you just don't feel like you have any power. Right, that's exactly right. I know, for personal experience. <laughs> right. When your front squat is uh, 50 kilos more than your best deadlift, uh, you know what it feels like to not get over the bar. <laughs> yeah. So what, was then, your, what was your best front squat? 273. What was your 272 best? 272 and a half. Oh, and then your best deadlift kind of came around when you switched Oh, it was after, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I front squatted 230 before I could deadlift 230. Oh. I front squatted 230 before I back squatted 230. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. I front squatted 230 and I never clean and jerked more than 170. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to laugh at you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so general strength exercises, okay. heavy emphasis on low back strength, yep. slow eccentrics to the back, obviously great movement. Uh, RDLs are essentially you know, a slow eccentric deadlift that you never put down. Yeah. Uh, and then any kind of specific pulling actions, like pulling movements you would use. I would say pulls, when I say pulls, I mean things that are, you know, you do a snatch pull to the knee, I'd still call it a pull rather than a deadlift. Yeah, so we, we would do a lot of partial pulls to the knee or we would do something with uh, 
stops along the way or pauses along yeah. the way. And I think, I think those are going to be your bang for your bang for the buck exercises where you can isolate the exact position. And I think that's kind of Im yeah. important. And, and what we're getting at with RDLs and slow eccentric movements is that you can't avoid it. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're keeping your hips high when you hinge over to an RDL, you can't avoid getting in front of a bar. You can't avoid loading the hamstrings and hips. Yeah. So the same with pauses at the knee, above the knee, um, mid thigh if you're transitioning under and you're, you're working on that. Like you can't avoid being balanced and strong yeah. and, and hitting those positions correctly. Yeah. And then the final point I would make in regards to squat volume, somebody who has an issue staying on top of the bar properly, they don't get over the bar right, I would reduce overall squatting mm -hmm. volume because it's only going to continue the same technical error when you feel the need to have strong legs and you feel the need to try to use your strong legs to get to that position, right. it reinforces getting behind the bar early, right? right? Whereas yeah. even with, like, I would increase squatting volume and probably would decrease some pulling volume for someone in the opposite mm -hmm. case where they yeah. fall over the bar and their hips come up too quickly. Yeah. So then we solve that, we're, we're cruising, we're, fi we're <laughs> fixing the world's lifting technique right now. What do we do as far as exposure to special exercises? What exercises do we wanna load this person with? Yeah, so immediately what comes to mind... Let's for, say someone who gets over the bar too far. Okay, so hips, immediately, hips come up too yeah, immediately what comes to mind, and I think this would work on both of those issues, is just a slow pull snatch or tempo snatch right. or slow snatch, uh, you know, whichever camp you subscribe to, that'll kind of dictate the name. But just a really slow tempo, exaggerating to about above the knee, about mid-thigh, and then exploding and finishing the movement and just ensuring balance and even pressure as you stand up. So you, one, you can not get too over the bar yep. or not get behind the bar but you can stay right on top of it as the bar elevates to above the knee and you can make that transition happen uh, so i'd say slow variations of every movement so i do slow muscle snatches slow snatches slow power snatches kind of depends on the phase uh depends on the place within the week but uh, you can use that that kind of uh that, that variation for pretty much any snatch or clean. Right, and because they're tempo, they're slower, you're probably gonna end up using lower loads. Right. So these are probably good exercises to be done on lighter training sessions or as primer movements yeah. before a main heavy exercise. Mm -hmm. As far as positional work from blocks, somebody who has a problem with their hips coming up too, too quickly, do you find, I mean, would you prescribe uh, block variations? Uh, I would probably, I would use block variations. I might, not that you were asking this, but I might go to hang variations first. Uh, and I think generally like the low hang variations of maybe doing some sort of augmented pull up. And then as you come down, you're like loading the legs effectively For to someone sure. who gets over the bar too far. Hips yeah. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think you have to coordinate that like right over the bar and then the squat down. And then as you start to stand up, you can feel that squat back up. So mm -hmm. you can almost like prime the movement by feeling it as you lower the barbell. Yeah. Um, as far as off the blocks, yeah, I think I think like a just a low block that's maybe a few inches. I generally see people can get into a better setup yeah. and almost hold that like initial squat as they they break the weight from the floor. Yeah, um, it, you know, Keisha went off the I low blocks recently. Say, yeah. Snatch one ten, which is yeah. a massive lift, and sometimes she'll let her hips move a little quick off yeah. the floor, and she held positions like perfectly. Yeah, yeah. So I think the block work does a very good job of reinforcing the use of your legs for people whose hips rise up quickly. Uh, block work will definitely have an impact on your ability to use your legs properly and integrate them into the transition and explosion. Right. From below the knee, I like it because it, again, allows them to basically put their hips in a higher position right. relative to the floor where they would be off the ground. So they kind of get into a great position there. Mm -hmm. You can use that as mechanical overload. You can go a little bit heavier from those positions than they might be training currently from the floor. Right. Uh, but also it's just you're reinforcing good mechanics. Above the knee as well is good because it forces them or you can allow them to basically yeah. initiate that transition properly and get their knees under the bar mm -hmm. where they belong, yeah. right? Hang variations, I think, do a great job for people who get behind the bar early simply because they're doing very much the same things as like RDLs and whatnot yeah. in that you're putting more pressure on the low back, you're you're forcing a lifter to basically control that that eccentric and put the bar in the right spot, but also there's just much more pressure there, right? Mm -hmm. So they're actually getting some feeling of being able to do a lift when their back is the thing that's actually working, right? So they can maintain position there. Someone has really strong legs going off the blocks, 
sometimes can just be like a trick lift where it's yeah. like you're so powerful from the top position yeah. that you basically are able to do whatever you want there and not get a whole lot out of it. Doesn't right. mean they're useless, but not as valuable as the hang lifts in my opinion. Yeah, so what would you say about standing on a block or like doing so, a deficit lift? Yeah, deficit I think is a good exercise for somebody who has a very difficult time staying on top of the bar. They get behind it early uh, because it basically elongates the pull. Somebody who's got shorter legs, stronger legs, probably doesn't have the same, you know, they're not gonna pull the bar as long as somebody who has longer legs, even though they're right. the same height. So they don't develop the same velocity at the end of the pull. Right. So I think deficits do a good job of allowing them that feeling. It's gonna feel like they're pulling forever, which they already feel like anyways. Right. That's why yeah. they get behind the bar. So I think it's a good way to exaggerate that and use it. People who have long legs, you can do them, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like the payoff won't be as big as a different variation. Right. Yeah. Any thoughts from you as far as those go? Uh, I've found that I, because I've done like blocks of deficit lifts or do multiple times a week. Um, I didn't quite see the transfer I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. So I think it's almost like too familiar or right. too similar to the yeah. classic lift. It kind of just adds to your, your superpower already. <laughs> right. right. So if you're not seeing like a clear distinction in the, the change in your technique, I would say it's kind of like novelty for novelty sake. Exactly. Yeah. And so I would say as a recommendation for this as far as programming goes, we've talked about this a lot. Change the training loads a little bit. When you add exercises to the program, start them a little bit lighter as far as the load goes. Don't be afraid to do a little more volume as far as number of reps per set. Right. Uh, but then additionally, work in that range where you're just barely making the error, uh, but you know you can still do it right if you're completely focused and able to train you know, hard there. Then move above and below that point to get exposure to it, try to kind of work that error up higher in the intensity band until it gets to a point where you don't see the error until it's really heavy weights. Uh, and then as far as everything else goes, you know, incorporate these exercises as drills, as general movements, switch some of your pulls out to be things that are maybe targeting the error a little bit better. Uh, and overall, that's what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? No, I thought it was great. Great. If you guys like this podcast, go ahead and check out the rest of what we have on the YouTube channel. It is just popping off. Uh, if you've got an RPE 7 to 8 friend here, go ahead and tell them about it. Subscribe. If you're looking for one of us to write you a program that has all of these components in it that fixes your shitty lifting, <laughs> then go ahead and check out Remote Coaching from Josh at philosophicalwayofting.com or from me at teamada.com. Or better yet, <laughs> go ahead and have a computer robot build you a program that does all these things. You've even got the ability to customize that program in the app at weightlifting.ai. You can switch exercises that you want. You can put new things in. You can change things. You can do whatever you want in that program, and it is amazing. Go ahead and check it out, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.